Uh, my name is Adam McGivern. I'm the Executive Director of the Portland Downtown Partnership. Thank you so much for coming tonight, um, between your attendance tonight, as well as you know the um, tremendous amount of input we received from the surveys, um, nearly 700, I believe, from the community, which is you know really a testament to how people care and are concerned about our downtown. Um, we're really looking forward to going through a little bit of the preliminary information that was revealed from those studies. Um, and of course, hearing directly from our consultant on this project, um, what we have in our downtown, what opportunities we have, um, and I think it's you know it's it's a great exercise to go through. Um, as far as specifically what this project is, it's a market analysis. Um, we're looking at what the community perceives as you know kind of our strengths, strengths and weaknesses, you know things that we should bring in the community, and then looking at the data as far as you know, what's realistic? What, where's that sweet spot between what we want and what we can afford? So, with that introduction, this is Kennedy Smith, um, the longest tenure director of the National Main Street Center, I believe, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. Um, <laughs> National Main Street Center, um, what they do, they're the go-to organization for all things Main Street throughout this country. So, we're very glad to have her. Great, thanks. I was going to introduce myself, but Adam's introduced me, so I will just uh, go right on. Uh, my assignment, as Adam said, is really to sort of look at at what's um, at what's feasible and what's possible. And so I'm looking at uh, the downtown's existing retail performance and also what its retail potential is. But I'm going to also talk a little bit tonight about how, no matter what the potential is, there are lots of possibilities. So I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, I'll be, you know, working working with the organization to outline a business development strategy for the district, um, and then also offering some guidance on implementation between my work at the Main Street Center and my work for the Community Land Use and Economics Group. Uh, after that, I've worked with around 1,500 communities over the years, so I have lots of examples I can share with you about places that have tried different things and worked and haven't worked, and get you in touch with those people so you can actually learn from uh, learn from their firsthand experiences. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to get to is sort of a strategy-driven uh, downtown economic transformation. These are the four broad areas of work of the Main Street approach. And what I'm going to be uh, working towards is identifying two or three sort of cross-cutting economic development <coughs> strategies that are based on uh, market uh, options, market possibilities, market reality, and also what people in the community would like to see, um, so that there's a, a sort of a sweet spot. It's like everybody always says they want a bookstore, uh, but it takes you know 80,000 people to support a bookstore in the market area, so unless you can find other ways to make it work. So trying to balance what people want and what the market can support. Um, and then based on that, uh, we can then go back and figure out what has to happen in terms of design, organizational partnerships, and resources, marketing, to make those things work. Um, an example uh, I could give you is when I was a downtown manager myself back in the dark ages of the 1980s, um, one of our strategies was to get um, downtown workers to shop more and be more economically involved in the downtown. This was in Charlottesville, Virginia. We had about 5,000 workers. Um, <laughs> None of whom shopped downtown. We surveyed them and they all said basically we don't buy a thing down here, we don't have lunch down here, we get in our cars and drive out to the Strip to have lunch, <coughs> even though we had 21 restaurants that were open at lunchtime. So we um, figured out things that we needed to do to get them engaged more. And we found there were some pragmatic reasons, like we had really slow restaurants so they couldn't get in and out in an hour. Um, there were just all kinds of, of things that were, were challenges. So in terms of design, we learned from our uh, market research and our surveys um, that we needed to um, repair some potholes and fix the lighting in public parking lots because we were hearing from the workers that they were afraid they were going to trip in a pothole and break an ankle or something. Um, we had to get uh, business owners to change their window displays more often because uh, the business owners were thinking that their main customer group was tourists and a tourist walks by your store once that's when we're going to see it whereas the downtown workers see it every day and after a week or two they just tune out the same window display. They don't notice a change. So we had to get them to change their window displays more often. We had to change our organizational partnerships. Our marketing activities completely changed um, so that we were doing many more of our activities during lunchtime and immediately after work instead of on weekends because that's when the downtown workers were there. Um, and in terms of economic restructuring, we had a, a pretty clear hit list of the products and services that these people were telling us they wanted on a daily basis downtown. 
um, some of which turned into new freestanding businesses, but many of which turned into additional product lines that our existing businesses added, so that they could just sort of round out the, uh, the merchandise that they had. Um, so that's how this will kind of affect the four points in the work that the organization does. Um, and once you've figured out what those specific tasks are in each of those four bright areas of work for each of these strategies, you can then figure out um, who's responsible for each of them, what the budget's going to be, what the timeline is, the funding source, how you're going to measure success. So it kind of teases out into a pretty practical, uh, implementable work plan. Um, so I've done some, uh, some research uh, before my visit. This is my first time in Portland uh, today, by the way. Um, and I'll give you some of my impressions in a second. Um, but I found in looking at the numbers, um, there's plenty of seats up here. I usually like if nobody sits in front of you, just take the front seats away, then you guys be the front. Um, you know, population size is relatively stable. It's kind of fluctuated a little bit down and then a little bit up, um, but pretty much the same. And there's some good and bad things in that. I mean, the good thing is that you're not like bleeding population like many communities in the US are. Um, the bad thing is that it means that because you don't have organic population growth without adding new residents, you're going to have to find a different way to grow retail market demand if you want to retail stuff. Um, median age has dropped, dropped between 2010 and uh, 2014. A little bit, not a huge amount, but um, you know, slightly more, more youth. The county's median age increased slightly, so maybe some of the people are moving out to the county as they get older. Uh, percentage of residents who are over 25 years of age with college degrees dropped uh, by 12.5% between 2010 and 2014, but the county saw an uptick. So again, I'm kind of wondering if you're uh, losing some residents to, uh, uh, to the county. Median household income grew in both the city and the county. Good. Um, and the, the uh, industry groups that saw the largest percentage increases in employment um, over the past roughly five years are information, which includes um, publishing, broadcasting, um, IT activities, wholesale trade, and educational services, healthcare, and social assistance. So maybe some, some legs there for, for job growth. Um, I also looked at uh, downtown businesses. I, I pulled a directory of all downtown businesses, business entities, which includes not just for-profit businesses, but also nonprofit organizations, uh, government entities. So um, I looked at their distribution. I found that within a half a mile of the intersection of Maine and Central, you have 443 business entities, 5,100 workers, 5,100 workers within a half mile. Um, Retail trade is a relatively small percentage of the overall number of business entities that you have. It's about 4.4%, but you have a lot of business entities for a relatively small, compact downtown. There's a lot of stuff going on, um, kind of tucked away here and there. And retail trade employs about 5.3% of, of those uh, 5,100 workers. Um, this is uh, just showing you what the distribution is of uh, business entities and then of workers. And you can see that like although retail uh, you know, accounts for a percentage there. It's not, um, it's not showing up in workers. This is the eye test portion of the evening. This is um, a sales void analysis. And I'm gonna, let me explain what this is. Basically, um, if you compare the amount of money that people who live in Cortland are probably spending someplace based on their household income, their ages, their um, household sizes, their education levels, all those demographic characteristics, how much they are spending someplace to the amount of money that businesses in Cortland are actually capturing, that gives you a sense of if the community is keeping its local dollars, the dollars, the, the expenditures of its residents are losing them someplace else or attracting them from someplace. So, for example, um, in motor vehicle and parts dealers, uh, you had this is for last year, um, about $2.1 million in sales. People who live here probably spend about $24.7 million someplace on cars and automotive stuff, meaning that you're losing about $22.7 million in sales in that category, okay? You're, you're gaining, you have a lot of uh, surplus in gasoline stations, uh, <laughs> restaurants, which tells me what? Visitors. You've got a lot of tourists in the area. Um, they're passing through. You have an overall surplus of about $64 million, but that's almost completely offset by these two categories, more than offset by it. 
you've got significant leakages in other other categories, general merchandise stores, um, clothing and clothing accessories, building materials, electronics, uh, furniture and home furnishings. Some of these things are really hard to build back. Um, for example, electronics. Um, has anyone bought an electronic anything on Amazon in the past few years? Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone does. The market is kind of going, uh, going that way. Um, clothing stores are kind of a tricky one. You have, you know, $7 million sales leakage there. But here's the thing about clothing stores. Um, when people shop for clothes and shoes and clothing accessories, they like to go to places where they can go to several stores and compare uh, styles and brands and prices before they make a buying decision, which is what regional shopping malls specialize in. Regional shopping malls are all about apparel. That's 90% of what their sales are. And that's why they have 10 shoe stores and not one or two shoe stores, and they have 30 clothing stores, <coughs> because people go there and they like to, to try things out. Because of that, in order to make clothing work in a downtown, you have to have enough unmet market demand, not just to support one store, but to support a cluster of them. So it's, it can be a little bit tricky. You can have clothing stores that function as destination businesses, um, and therefore will draw people from a larger area. But that's a kind of a trickyish thing to, to, uh, to play with. Another category where you have uh, kind of a surprising leakage is non-store retailers. A non-store retailer is a retailer who sells things from someplace other than a store. Um, Girl Scout cookies, Avon, um, heating oil, um, all those things are non-store retailers, but so are uh, online businesses. And this is a huge area of growth in the U.S. A lot of businesses are selling stuff online, including a lot of downtown businesses. Um, that component of their sales would be considered non-store retailers. So I think you probably, the downtown can have a bigger web presence um, than it does in terms of business growth. So this is the city of Portland. I did the same analysis for Portland County. Um, and here, you can see that there's a smaller overall um, surplus. Many similar patterns, um, big surplus in gasoline stations and restaurants, um, and leakages in many of the other places. They're the ones who are catching the uh, auto sales. You can see from that top line. And then finally, I did the same analysis for uh, drive time radii. I looked at uh, a five minute drive time from the intersection of Maine and Central, a 10 minute drive time, and a 20 minute drive time. And that's kind of what the math is of those areas. And here I'm just showing you what the void is, what that, that last column is. And uh, for five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes. And what I see when I look at this is that the 10 minute drive time area has an enormous sales surplus. Well, I drove out 10 minutes a day to see what's there, and that's where the big boxes are. Okay, so they're, they're getting a surplus. You have kind of a, although you still have surpluses here and there, you've got a drop off in the five minute drive time and a drop off in the 20 minute drive time. Which tells me those are the places I would probably look for opportunities, is uh, you know, people right here in the immediate vicinity, which could be sort of convenient, sort of daily staple sorts of things. And then also looking a little bit further out for specialty things. And here in the 20 minute drive time area, there actually are lots of leakages. Um, including $26 million in clothing. So. And these numbers are estimated? They're, they're estimates, but they're pretty, they're pretty close estimates, yeah. So it's based on the sales, the actual sales information is based on um, state sales tax reports, the census of retail trade, the census of non-employee uh, um, non businesses, which are mom and pop businesses, which they can draw instead of having staff. The uh, estimates of market demand come from a very cool uh, report uh, done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics called the Consumer Expenditure Survey. They basically survey 100,000 households across the country every year and ask them to record uh, in a diary one week every three months for a year um, everything they spend. So you buy a pack of chewing gum, you pay your electric bill, you write it down. And then they munch this all up according to your demographic characteristics. So it gives you this profile of what people, what households spend um, on average, depending on their demographics. Um, they use households instead of individuals because households spend money in more predictably similar ways than individuals. If you're a household, you have you know, probably one set of living room furniture and one refrigerator. The same thing if you're an individual living alone. Um, fascinating document. I was looking at it years ago. 
um, and saw this trend, which has now kind of changed a little bit, but it was fascinating. I was looking at the amount of money that people, that households spend on alcoholic beverages. A one-person household, this is probably 15 years ago, spent about 150 bucks a year on alcohol. Two-person households spent about $200 a year. So you figure, you know, the adage is true, you get married, you settle down, you don't carouse as much, you spend less on alcohol. The first child comes and it skyrockets. <laughs> and it just keeps on going. So it's a, um, it's a great document. It just really uh, tell, tells you a lot about America. So that's where those estimates come from. So you look at the demographics of the community. I don't want to get you off track, but I'm just curious, for instance, with clothing. Yeah. Um, my hunch is that they have, that when they count something like clothing, they're counting it fairly standard, like H&M. Uh -huh. Traditional clothing. But what about when you're getting into custom clothing, resale clothing? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, Ithaca has a huge amount of and very popular resale vintage clothing, yeah. and that kind of thing. Does that get counted in there? Is it is counted in there, but what this is telling me, I mean, you know, so, so sometimes you see anomalies that are very unique to a place. Right. Like, if you have a community where everybody has a backyard vegetable garden, yeah. then you might see them spending less in groceries <clears throat> than normally. You have a leakage there. Or sometimes you have communities where you've got a lot of uh, double-income households and everybody eats out. Nobody cooks at home, so you yeah. see a surplus in, in, in restaurants and a, and a leakage in groceries. Um, I worked with a community once that had a big IBM research facility, and there was no men's clothing store for 30 miles around. It was nothing. And but these guys, it was like mostly men working there, uh, wonks, all of them, um, and they they um, had a lot of money. They they they, had, they they earned pretty good money. No clothing store. We surveyed them because there was market demand out the wazoo for men's clothing on paper. Interviewed them, and it turns out they wore exactly the same suits, the same things every day, yeah. and they spent all their money on consumer electronics. You could have the best men's clothing store in the world in the lobby of their building, and they wouldn't notice. Yeah. So there, there are those anomalies, but this does tell me that um, in this category, in 20 cent furniture and home furnishings, the market's missing something. I mean, this is too big a leakage for, you know. There's something that people are not getting here that they might want. And so I think that they're actually, it's rare that I think that there's an opportunity for a downtown to develop a cluster of clothing stores because of those challenges. I think you could do it. I think that there could be um, enough demand there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we did have a clothing store here, but wasn't able to make it. And your analysis of the city, it says that there is the need for the clothing store. You had a clothing store. So there needs to be several. And does there yeah. need to be a specific type of clothing store? So, uh, good questions, and these are questions still to be answered, I think. But um, there are some clothing stores that function as destinations. So they need to be part of a cluster. Um, things like um, uh, bridal attire. And lo and behold, you have one of those. Yeah. Um, uh, uniform shops. Um, Outdoor. Outdoor, yeah. I mean, there, 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 there are, are some outdoor, kinds of businesses yeah. that, that, that the people will go, will go wherever it is because it's unique or it's one of a kind or the service is incredible or something. But um, it's better if you have a cluster of them. It's good if they are located within easy eyesight of each other because then they're generating foot traffic for each other. So you have to really kind of plan it well. Um, but you have, you know, a, some pretty good footholds there. I think the fact that you have a uh, the bridal store, for example, this is kind of another topic. But you have a couple of stores downtown that do have a pretty strong regional draw. That's one. Uh, you have a, a music store. I mean, those are rare these days. You know, that's drawing from a large area. So if you have people who are coming here for those businesses already, when they're here, what else might they do? What else might they buy? There are other potential <coughs> opportunities here. So I think that's. Clothing and clothing accessories, and to an extent, furniture and home furnishings are categories that are worth um, taking a look at as possibilities. Any other <coughs> questions on this? Um, the surveys. So you guys were um, over the top in uh, completing surveys. It's I usually find about 300, 350 people complete surveys, public surveys, you got almost 700. 
So, um, really awesome. Um, <coughs> now, it's a self-selecting group. We didn't, you know, randomly, you know, select a random sample of people in the community so that we could apply it universally. These were people who wanted to take the survey. So, um, there is a little bit of bias, I think, in there that I'm going to talk about in a second. And we basically asked five uh, categories of questions. The first is, what three words come to mind when you think about downtown Portland? The second is, downtown Portland would be better if, dot, dot, dot. Um, what businesses do you most often patronize downtown? What businesses would you like to see downtown? Um, and a few things about demographics, just a couple of questions. So here's the three words. I've, I've made this a word cloud, so the, the, the larger the word, the more, the more often it came up in the responses. What three words come to mind when you think about downtown Portland? <laughs> 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 Yeah, those dirty college students. The beer has potential. Yeah. But there's boring restaurants and bars. You can't really read this linearly, it doesn't make sense. But um, yeah, I saw this and I got a little scared, you know, thinking about what am I going to find when I get to Portland? To find the bars? Yeah. Then we said downtown Portland would be better if, dot, dot, dot. And these are the kinds of things that we heard. There were more stores. Fewer bars and more shops, or I think cuisine restaurants. Limit speed on Main Street, hard to back out of parking spaces without getting hit. Main Street was a two-way street. There are more apartments on the upper floors. Law enforcement would walk the street all day and night. <laughs> Child-friendly options, family events, all the storefronts were filled, not so many empty storefronts. Family-friendly. Fewer drug deals. <laughs> not a parking time limit. Do these things sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So the more I read these, I'm not going to, I mean, we had, there were 1,500 responses to this question because people could write several different things. Um, I, I'm not going to go into them in great detail because, you know, we would be here all night. But it, um, but, you know, certain themes emerged. People were talking about uh, parking, about the one-way street, about wanting more stores, um, more focus on locals, less focus on, on <coughs> college students. Those are the major things that, that came out. Probably nothing at all surprising to, to anybody here. What businesses do you most often patronize? Wow. The post office. Wow. Yeah, the post office was the biggest. Mm -hmm. Brew, Brew would have been bigger, Brew 64, except some people just called it Brew, and so it turned up in the work cloud mm -hmm. algorithm in two different places. They're all restaurants. They're all food. Yeah. And the post office. Tompkins Trust is in there. The library is in there. But it's mostly food. But it's not all that's down here. It's, all, it's what's pr primarily promoted by the leadership. To well, people are going to these places. Then well, what right. types of new businesses would you like to see downtown? That's a big story. Again, clothing would have been bigger, except some called a clothing store. If not for that, it would have been um, off the chart the biggest, uh, the biggest thing. Clothing stores, clothing, clothing store. Well, women would probably be women. <laughs> and some men, yeah. I want to go to the man store. <laughs> yeah. And you know things like shoes. <laughs> buy me some women's uh, Things like shoes and shoe stores are clothing. That falls into the clothing, the apparel category. So I see on paper that it looks like there is some market softness in the apparel category. I see in the survey people are saying, man, we really want this. It makes me think, okay, let's test this a little bit more and take it a little further and see what um, scenarios we could come up with. Anything else in here that's of interest or surprising? That tiny little comment down there in the children. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how did they yeah. get that big? I don't know. Um, movie theater, movie theater, pet store, Hallmark store, art gallery, gift shop, art, books. Books comes up fairly often. We also surveyed business owners, downtown business owners. And 50% of those who completed the survey own retail businesses. The others have, um, you know, insurance agencies or they operate nonprofit organizations or something. 
Um, 81% said that business is as good or as or as good as or better than last year, um, which I thought was a pretty positive sign. 55% um, of sales are made weekdays during the day. 17% um, of the retailers have an online storefront, and online sales account for 7% of sales. That's kind of low compared to what I've been seeing around the country in the past couple of years. Um, That's kind of a missed opportunity, I think. Oh, I yeah. totally agree with you. Totally agree. I mean, in, in any community where you have uh, a large visitor population, you've got you know tourists who come through, you've got the college students who kind of come and go and their families, you've got an opportunity to make lifelong customers. I, um, I think I told the board or committee on the phone once about my shoes. Did I tell you the story about my shoes? Oh, yeah. I think it's a good story. I like it. <laughs> um, I buy almost all of my shoes from this guy in Oskaloosa, Iowa, downtown Oskaloosa. Um, anybody ever been to Oskaloosa? Yeah, no one you, No one goes there. They, they have no tourists. They don't have a college. Well, they don't have a college, but it's tiny. Um, they're not on the visitor path like you guys are. Um, I was there 25 years ago. They were launching their Main Street program. I was a uh, flying on the sidewalk in a hurry to get to a meeting, and I pass the shoe store, and I see in the corner, out of the corner of my eye, a pair of Rockport pumps that I had a pair of and I really liked. And I went in, and I said to the guy, if you've got these in six and a half medium in navy blue, I'll take them right now. I don't need to try them on. And he says, I have them. Here you go. Bought the shoes and left. A few months later, he tracks me down at my office in Washington. This is pre-internet, so we had to like call an operator, you know. Um, to find my number, calls me and says, I just got in a shipment of those uh, rock ports that you liked, and I put aside a pair in every color in your size, in case you need one. Um, I love this guy. I, uh, uh, you know, he is my longest term relationship ever. Um, it's been, you know, 25 years. I've been doing business with him. He'll, he'll send me shoes in the mail with, uh, you know, a note saying this is a new brand. I thought it looked like you. It runs a little bit small, so I'm sending